Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler. In this lecture concerns Chapter 9, Democracy in America, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop. The period discussed in this chapter has one central figure who dominates most of it, and that is the politician Andrew Jackson. To understand Andrew Jackson and the, the force and power that he brought to politics in America, it's good to review some of the significant events in his life that tell us about his character and his resolve. One of those occurred when he was only 13 years old. This was during the time of the American Revolution, and he volunteered to be part of the Revolutionary Army. Now, he was just a young boy. And he didn't really know what he was doing, and he ended up being captured by the British. He was then put to work for a British soldier and assigned to by that soldier to shine the soldier's shoes. Andrew Jackson refused to do this work for the British sol soldier, and as a consequence, the soldier brought down a sword upon Andrew Jackson's head, slicing his scalp to the bone. Now, the story is recounted to show the stubbornness, the strong will of Andrew Jackson that you will see throughout his life. When he was 39 years old, he ended up in a dispute with a man named Charles Dickinson. They both owned racehorses, and there was a controversy about one of them potentially cheating in a horse race. Dickinson brought this accusation against Andrew Jackson, who thought that his honor had been um, uh, brought into question and he challenged Dickinson to a duel. Now, this was a bit of a uh, surprising thing since Dickinson was a renowned duelist. He was considered the best shot in the state of Tennessee where they lived. Dueling was actually prohibited there, so they went across the state line to Kentucky where dueling was legal. The men paced off from each other, turned, and then on the command to fire, Charles Dickinson shot Andrew Jackson in the chest. The bullet was deflected by a button on his vest and lodged near his heart. Amazingly, Andrew Jackson did not fall, although the bullet would remain there near his heart for the rest of his life because it was so close that they can, the surgeons considered it too dangerous to ever remove. It caused him pain his whole life, yet in the moment that he was shot, he did not fall. Instead, he stood still, drew his gun, and attempted to shoot Charles Dickinson in return. When he pulled the, the lever, though, the um, hammer on the gun only moved halfway. Now, this was in a sort of a gray spot in dueling at the time. If the hammer had fallen all the way and the gun had failed to fire, that would have counted his shot. But since it only went halfway, he recocked the gun, took careful aim, and shot Charles Dickinson dead. When Andrew Jackson was 47 years old, he received a commission to command military troops in the War of 1812. He ended up serving in a side controversy, a battle with the, the Creek Indians in the southern United States. There he became famous for his defeat of some of them in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which we discussed in a previous chapter. His command of his troops brought such respect from them that they ended up nicknaming him Old Hickory. Hickory is a particularly tough kind of wood, and that's what they saw him as, is a particularly tough kind of commander. But he was a successful commander. By the end of the war, he was serving as the defender of New Orleans when the British forces attacked there. Though vastly outnumbered, he organized a ragtag group of people to defend the city, both military regulars, Native American allies, even free black men. In the ensuing battle, the American forces under Andrew Jackson only suffered 300 casualties, while inflicting over 2,000 casualties on the attackers and repulsing the attack of the British. You may remember from a previous chapter that this battle actually took place after a peace treaty had already been signed, but the news had not yet spread to New Orleans. Well, the victory in this battle against overwhelming odds made Andrew Jackson famous throughout the country. He would eventually parlay that fame into becoming president of the United States. Now, we will talk about that later on, 
But right now, I just want to highlight an event that happened to him as president to show his continuing tough character. At one point, an assassin attempted to kill him. When the assassin pulled out his gun and tried to fire it, the gun misfired. The assassin then pulled out a second pistol and tried to shoot again, and it also misfired. By then, Andrew Jackson, who was 68 years old, had pulled out his cane and then beat the assassin mercilessly for his attempt at killing him. Andrew Jackson wasn't just a famous commander when he was in the military, but he actually had a significant role in some events in American history during his earlier life. In a follow-up to the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson continued to command troops in the southern United States, and he was engaged in what was called the First Seminole War. This was a, a battle between American troops and members of the Seminole Indian tribe who were living in Florida, and they were accused of crossing the border into American territory to harass um, settlers there. So Andrew Jackson took advantage of this to cross the border into Florida, Florida was Spanish territory at the time, and take the war to the Seminoles. Among things that he did there was he invaded and captured people and executed some even in Pensacola, Florida, the largest uh, Spanish settlement in the area at the time. Well, Andrew Jackson's invasion of Florida led the Spanish to believe that their hold on Florida was untenable, that they wouldn't be able to keep it against the, the Americans. So in 1819, they agreed to a treaty, the Adams-Onus Treaty, negotiated by John Quincy Adams, who would later also be a president of the United States. This treaty gave the Florida Territory to the United States of America. Well, we're mentioning treaties that expanded American territory. Before we move on, we should also mention the Convention of 1818. This was a treaty negotiated between Great Britain and the United States to settle where the northern border of American territories would be. Now remember, the United States, as we discussed in a previous chapter, purchased the Louisiana Territory, which stretched all the way from modern Louisiana all the way up to the state of Montana, they had purchased it from the French, but it was not agreed upon between the Great Britain, which possessed Canada, and the United States that now possessed Louisiana Territory, exactly where the border was between these two possessions. Well, the Convention of 1818 settled this, agreeing that the 49th parallel would not mark the northern border of the, of the United States and the southern border of Canada, at least as far as the Oregon country. The Oregon country was then jointly occupied by both the United States and Great Britain. It would be later divided also along the 49th parallel, giving the United States the, the states of Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and Great Britain the um, uh, province of British Columbia, which would eventually be part of Canada also. Also during this time period, an economic crisis hit America that we should mention before we move on. As these Western lands were settled, people engaged in land speculation. They went and bought the land that was made available in the anticipation that it would later become more valuable. Well, if it didn't become more valuable, then they would lose their investments. They wouldn't be able to pay back the banks, the loans that they'd received to buy them. And this would cause a chain reaction through the economy. People would then see the economy falling. They would rush on banks to get their money out before they before it became um, un, before they became unable to get it. This is what's called a panic. We discussed in a previous chapter about how panics routinely happened in America at this time. About every generation, there would be an economic downturn. People would panic, run on the banks, and it would turn into a general economic recession. This was one such occasion. One of the defining events of this time period in American history was the Missouri Crisis. The Missouri Crisis um, was set up by the balance of power between the free states and the slave states in the United States. If you looked at the Senate, there were free, 11 free states and 11 slave states, giving each group 22 senators. So it was a standoff in the United States Senate, 50-50. This was a 
intentional way designed to maintain the power of the free states so that they wouldn't have to be concerned about the free states outlying slavery. They would always have a check on that in the United States Senate. But if you compare that to the House of Representatives, you can see that in the House, the northern free states had an overwhelming advantage over the southern slave states. This shows that a majority of the population lived in free states that opposed slavery. So this created a conflict in the country, that a majority of the people were against slavery, but the southern states were able to maintain a tie in the Senate to always preserve slavery. This created a conflict which would eventually boil over into the American Civil War. At this time, though, the conflict was centered on what to do about the state of Missouri. Now, I say state of Missouri, but it was not yet a state. It was a territory carved out of the Louisiana Purchase, which was then eventually in a position, had enough people moved to it, to apply for statehood. And the question became what to do when it becomes a state. Does it come in as a free state or does it come in as a slave state? Because coming in as a free state could swing the balance of power in the United States Senate and allow potentially the northern free states to simply outlaw slavery in the country. But at the same time, a majority of the people in the country oppose the idea of bringing in another slave state. So the way this was resolved was through something that became known as the Missouri Compromise. This is negotiated by a man named Jesse Thomas, a senator from Illinois, and a man named Henry Clay, a senator from Kentucky. He became known as the Great Compromiser. This was his talent in the United States Senate to take people on different, um, different opposed positions and find a way to get them to come together. In this case, he worked with the senator from Illinois to create this Missouri Compromise. What the Missouri Compromise did was, first of all, it admitted Missouri as a slave state, but at the same time, it admitted Maine as a free state, thus preserving the balance in the United States Senate. We would have just as many free states as slave states. It then also drew a line across the country, off into the territories that the United States already possessed and might one day possess in the future. That line, the Missouri Compromise Line at 36 degrees, 30 minutes north, corresponded with the southern border of Missouri. And the compromise was any new states formed below that line would be slave states. Any states formed above that line would be in areas where slavery would be banned. According to the Missouri Compromise, in that unorganized territory that remained from the Louisiana Purchase, slavery would not be allowed. When this compromise was announced, not everyone thought it was a good idea. Thomas Jefferson, the founding father who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the former president of the United States, thought it would be the end of the Union. He was an old man at this time. And he wrote that when he heard of the compromise, it was like a fire bell in the night, that it was sounding the death nail, the ringing of a bell for somebody who has died for the United States of America. Why? Because he thought once this line was drawn, that there'd be no way to obliterate it, that we would continue on as a, sta as a country divided, slave and free. And that in so doing, we would have the wolf by the ear, as he put it. In other words, this evil practice of slavery is something that we are stuck with. If we let go of it, it would tear us up, but we can't keep holding on to it, which means in the end, we will inevitably be doomed as a country by it. It was during this time period that the Democratic Party formed. Now, when I say that the Democratic Party formed, that isn't entirely accurate. What I mean is it evolved out of the Republican Party. We have to be careful with these names of political parties because, as you've already seen in this course, there was a Republican Party in our country's history. That's not the same Republican Party that we have today. In fact, it changed its name over time to become what is the Democratic Party of today. Well, it's during this time period that that change of name took place. That change of name took place because, in part, there was a sectional divide in the country. With the defeat of the Federalists in the election of 1800, the Republican Party became the dominant party in America. Basically, 
almost all successful politicians were members of the Republican Party. But they were trying to represent vastly different parts of America, some free states, some slave states, that had very different um, goals for what their politicians should be doing. Well, when you have politicians with very different goals trying to inhabit the same political party, you're eventually going to have division within it, which is what happened. Another thing that happened during this time period was the democratization of America. This time period between the American Revolution and eventually the United States Civil War is called the antebellum. And during the antebellum period, laws, regulations were changed to allow more and more people to participate in the political process. This is called democratization. And this changed the nature of politics as politicians had to appeal more and more to the common man to get themselves elected rather than just to elites. So not only was there a regional divide forming, but there was also potentially a divide between uh, politicians that appealed to these new voters and politicians to appeal to more to elite voters who had existed in the past. This division culminated in the election of 1824, when the Republican Party had four major candidates for president. Henry Clay, the great compromiser we already talked about, Andrew Jackson, the man who I began this chapter with the description of, John Quincy Adams, who I mentioned, who negotiated the treaty that gave the United States Florida, who was the son of John Adams, who was the first president of the United States, and William Crawford, a powerful member of Congress. None of these men would bow out for the other, and really, they fell into two major factions. There was Andrew Jackson, who appealed to these new democratized voters, the common men of the country. His group of people who supported him ended up being called Democratic Republicans. On the other side, there were what were called National Republicans, and both John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay appealed to this faction within the Republican Party. When the election occurred, nobody won a majority. Andrew Jackson secured the most votes in the Electoral College. Now, I'm not going to take time to try to explain the Electoral College here again, but remember the basic idea is that the states assign electors, and they did so, generally speaking, by this time period, based on the vote of the common voter. So common voters would go to the polls, say in, in Georgia, they would cast their votes, and then the state legislature would look at who they supported, and based on that, assign electors who would then vote for that person. So you can see here on this map, voters in Georgia preferred Crawford, and so nine electors were assigned to vote for Crawford. Well, this was done all over the country, and Andrew Jackson ended up with the most electors that would vote for him for president, 99. John Quincy Adams had 84, Crawford 41, and Henry Clay only 37. None of them had a majority, which under the provisions of the United States Constitution meant that the election would then be decided by the House of Representatives. Delegations from the various states in the House of Representatives would each vote, casting their one vote from their state for one of these candidates. Before the election took place, Henry Clay decided to throw his support behind John Quincy Adams, his fellow national Republican. John Henry Clay, who was a member of the United States Congress, went to his friends in the House of Representatives and said, when it comes time to vote on who should be the president instead of voting for me, vote for John Quincy Adams instead. This was enough to swing the election in John Quincy Adams' favor, and he became the president of the United States in 1824. Andrew Jackson felt he had been cheated. He had received the most votes in the country. He had received the most electoral votes in the Electoral College. And, the, and so, though he had not received a majority of either, he still thought, having received the most, he should have been elected president. And he considered this deal between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams to be a corrupt bargain. He was just sure that John Quincy Adams had promised Henry Clay something in exchange for his support. Well, Andrew Jackson dealt with this loss by then, over the next four years, building an organization from the ground up, a democratic organization to get his people in place in lower offices, to get voters around the country on his side, so that then he could run against John Quincy Adams in the election of 1828 and defeat him. 
And that's exactly what happened in 1828, as Andrew Jackson was finally elected President of the United States. As President of the United States, John, excuse me, Andrew Jackson then had to deal with a major challenge to the United States as a whole. This was the nullification crisis. Part of what prompted the nullification crisis was that a few years before in South Carolina, a slave named Denmark Vesey had uh, led a conspiracy that intended to um, uh, stage an assault on the city of Charleston to seize arms and use them to seize ships, which then they could use to sail to so that freed slaves could then sail to the island of Haiti and join the revolution there. Well, when this was found out, the, the conspiracy was put to an end. The people who promoted, including Vesey, were executed, but it left a lasting fear among the people in South Carolina, a fear that caused them to crack down more on slaves. This then led to some people even more vigorously um, in other places of the country demand the end of slavery. It left the South Carolinians suspicious of what other people in the country might do who hadn't been there, who hadn't been threatened by the slavery uprising, what they might do to try to end slavery there and put the people of South Carolina in greater danger, they believed. So with this as sort of a background, then in 1828, the United States Congress passed a law that, which became known in the South as the Tariff of Abominations. What it was, was a tax on imports coming in from particularly European countries. Th what this tax did in effect was made finished goods brought in from Europe much more expensive. Now this was done to make people in the United States of America more likely to buy American made goods because they would be relatively cheaper, even if they weren't seen as necessarily the same quality as the ones coming in from Europe. So the idea was we, we make things coming in from another country more expensive by putting a high tax on them, which will then lead people in this country to buy American made things. Now, that sounds great if you are in the North working in the manufacturing industry where you are producing these American made goods, which you want to have an advantage selling to other Americans. This actually is a bad thing if you live in the South. Why? Because the South primarily produced raw materials like cotton which they then sold to other countries, such as England, where they were then, where it was then used to make manufactured goods, such as clothing, which then might be sold back in America. So when things from England and other places in Europe become more expensive, then they don't sell as many. And when they don't sell as many, they're not gonna buy as many raw materials from the South. So while this tariff of abominations may have helped the economy in the North, it hurt the economy in the South severely. That's why it got this nickname. An abomination is something that is horrible, and Southerners called this the Tariff of Abominations. This then led John C. Calhoun, who had previously been a senator from South Carolina and was currently serving as the Vice President of the United States in 1828, to write a document called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. Now, he did this anonymously at first, and in it, he advocated for the doctrine of nullification. This is the idea that states, as sovereign political entities, do not have to obey unconstitutional actions of the national government. Basically, he was saying that the national government has overstepped its boundaries. It has passed a law that does not treat different parts of the country equally. Therefore, States in the South, such as South Carolina, do not need to obey that law. They do not need to collect the tariff. They have no obligation to because the law imposing the tariff was unconstitutional. He had gotten this idea actually from Thomas Jefferson and James Madison back during the controversy over the Alien and the Sedition Acts. You may recall that from a previous lecture. This is where Jefferson and Madison made the argument that a law passed that is contrary to the, to the Constitution could be ignored by the states. Well, this idea that they put forth at the time was what John Calhoun grabbed onto for his South Carolina exposition and protest. 
This idea, formulated by Jefferson and Madison, and then re-expressed by Calhoun, is based in a notion that we call states' rights. States' rights is this idea that when the United States of America was formed, some of the powers of government were left outside the control of the national government, or what we call the federal government. They were left under the control of the states, and the states are entitled to protect those powers that were left to them, particularly against overreach from the national government. So if the national government starts trying to reach into the power of the states, then the states would be justified, in this particular case, in nullifying, in other words, refusing to obey those actions of the national government. This controversy over nullification led to a debate across the country, and in the United States Senate in particular. There, over several days, a senator from Massachusetts named Daniel Webster and a senator from South Carolina named Robert Hayne held a public debate over whether or not nullification made sense and was appropriate. During this debate, Webster famously said that liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. He was saying that the United States of America, once it became a union, could never be dissolved. And this was the position that people like him took. This was in conflict with the position being taken by the Southerners that not only could federal laws be nullified if they were too extreme, but that if things got worse enough that the, the states could even with, potentially withdraw from the Union to avoid um, these unconstitutional actions upon them. In the middle of this controversy, there was a dinner held in Washington, D.C., with Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States, presiding over it, and his Vice President, John C. Calhoun, in attendance. During that dinner, they both offered toasts. Andrew Jackson, as the leader of the national government, toasted, Our Federal Union, it must be preserved, showing his position within this debate that states like South Carolina must not push this too far and end up potentially causing the breakup of the Union. In response, when his term came, John C. Calhoun's toast was, the Union, next to our liberty, the most dear. Now notice what he is saying here. While he supports the Union, if there's ever a point in which the government of the United States is depriving people, or a state like South Carolina, of its, of its liberty, of its freedom, then that liberty comes before the country. In a debate between, excuse me, in a choice between the country or freedom, John Calhoun says he will take freedom and support South Carolina in this nullification crisis. As a result of this disloyalty, as Andrew Jackson saw it, when he ran for re-election for president in 1832, he selected a different vice president to run with him. Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren will show up again later in our story. Andrew Jackson in that election of 1832 then defeated Henry Clay. By this point, Andrew Jackson and his followers were simply called Democrats, no longer being referred to as Democratic Republicans. And Henry Clay was the nominee of the remaining part of the formerly Republican Party, now known as National Republicans. After Andrew Jackson was re-elected president, the nullification crisis came to a head. What happened was the state of South Carolina held a convention and they actually voted to nullify the tariff of abominations within their state. This meant that they were officially saying federal law cannot be enforced here because that federal law is unconstitutional. And they even threatened secession, in other words, leaving the United States of America. In response to this, the United States Congress passed the Force Bill of 1833, which authorized Andrew Jackson to organize troops and march upon South Carolina to force them to obey the tariff. 
Here is a, ca a cartoon from the time criticizing this decision, showing Andrew Jackson walking up steps to at least eventually seize a crown of despotism. In other words, to become a dictator of the United States. They thought that this force bill went too far, that he was using the nullification crisis as an excuse to seize and abuse power. Well, it, things didn't go that far. We evaded war. We we avoided a dictatorship. What happened was a compromise was negotiated. And in that compromise, the state of South Carolina would rescind their nullification of the treaty of the tariff, excuse me. But in response, the United States Congress would actually lower the tariff to an acceptable level. Interestingly, as this compromise was enacted and the tariff was lowered to a point that South Carolina could rescind its nullification. South Carolina at the same time voted to nullify the force bill, though it didn't really matter anymore. It was a way for them to assert what they still saw as their independence. In addition to the controversy over nullification in South Carolina, another event happened to uh, sever the ties between Andrew Jackson and his vice president, John C. Calhoun. That was the Eaton Affair. This was also sometimes described as the Petticoat Affair. This was a reference to a woman's garment that was worn under a skirt to make it puff out. And this was the nickname given to it because the, the Eaton Affair, this controversy that led to this division between Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun, was brought on by bickering among the wives of members of Andrew Jackson's cabinet. Andrew Jackson's cabinet was the group of men who he had chosen to run the various departments of government, such as the, the time the Department of War or the Department of State or the Department of the Treasury, etc. This bickering among the wives concerned a woman named Margaret O'Neill Eaton. Her husband was Andrew Jackson's Secretary of State. And it was how they became man and wife that was the problem here. Margaret Eaton was young. She was pretty. She came from a lower class family. And her husband had recently died from suicide when she remarried Eaton, who was the Secretary of State. This was looked upon as scandalous by some of the other women who were married to members of Andrew Jackson's cabinet. There were rumors swirling that Margaret had been in an affair with Secretary Eaton even before her husband died, that he may have even committed suicide because he learned of that affair. And then shortly after he was dead, she was then able to marry her lover. Because rumors like this swirled, the other women who were wives of the cabinet members refused to associate with her. And this schism caused a schism or a division between the members of the cabinet themselves. As their wives were fighting, they felt pulled into the fight too. So Andrew Jackson held a meeting with his cabinet members and he defended his Secretary Eaton and Secretary Eaton's wife and told the other members of the cabinet that they needed to leave them alone. Well, it didn't go over well. They still argued about whether or not what the Eatons had done was appropriate, whether or not they should associate with them. And finally, the only way this is resolved is four members of Andrew Jackson's cabinet, including Secretary of State Eaton, had to resign. Now, this wasn't as big a blow to Andrew Jackson's uh, management of the country as you might think, because Andrew Jackson didn't terribly um, hold his uh, cabinet in the greatest regard. While they were the people that he should have been going to for advice about how to run the executive branch, he simultaneously maintained what was known as the kitchen cabinet, a group of close advisors that he would meet with. They were called the kitchen cabinet because supposedly he would meet with them in the kitchen of the White House. And they were the ones that he talked to about what the government should or should not be doing rather than his official cabinet members. This was not the only controversy during Andrew Jackson's presidency. 
Another was known as the Bank War. We've previously talked about the Bank of the United States that was created early in our country's history and the debate over whether or not it was constitutional, which was eventually decided with the United States Supreme Court case of McCulloch versus Maryland. Well, that bank's charter eventually expired. Then a new Bank of the United States was created in 1816, this time with a 20-year charter, essentially a license to operate for the next 20 years. Well, as the time neared for that charter to end, members of Congress wanted to get ahead of the problem. They didn't want there to be a gap where we didn't have a Bank of the United States like it happened the first time. So in 1832, they passed a law proposing a renewal of the bank's charter for an additional 20 years. Now notice they're already four years ahead of time, but they thought that they could get it through at this time. Nonetheless, Andrew Jackson vetoed the charter of the Bank of the United States. He considered it to be unconstitutional. As he looked back, he agreed with the opinion of Thomas Jefferson at the time that it was not a valid exercise of national power. Those who supported the bank saw this as an abuse of power by Andrew Jackson, that if Congress wanted the bank, he should let them have the bank. They sometimes referred to him as acting like a king. In fact, a, a evil king, a despot. Now, he had vetoed the charter of the Bank of the United States as renewal, but that was still years away. He wanted to get rid of it now because he considered it to be unconstitutional. So what he did in his capacity as president of the United States is he withdrew funds from the bank that had been deposited there by various government agencies. Now this happens because a government agency has handed money to do things, but it may not need to do them all at once. So it has to put the money somewhere in the meantime. Why not deposit it in the Bank of the United States? This then would allow the Bank of the United States to operate as banks do, collecting money, loaning it out, eventually giving people their money back, but along the way, making money off of interest that they charge on the loans that they give out. But what happened was Andrew Jackson said, nope, we aren't going to keep that money in the Bank of the United States anymore. And he ordered the various entities to withdraw their funds. What did they do with them then? Well, then they deposited them in various state banks that they were directed to by Andrew Jackson. These were known as his pet banks. And the argument was made, even though it doesn't seem to be always true, that the deposits were made into banks that were owned by friends of his to give them then the capital to make money off of. Now, enough was deposited in banks of his friends so that the accusation could be made, but it wasn't always done, which then could lead him to claim that there were no pet banks, that these were just the best banks to deposit, to, to deposit the money in. But the overall problem here for the Bank of the United States is that Andrew Jackson removed money from it, which made it unable to do the business it was set up to and led to its eventual failure. Andrew Jackson's actions of president um, caused enough people enough concern that an anti-Jackson movement developed in the country. If it had any one person as its head, it was Henry Clay the multi-time nominee of the Republicans to be president of the United States, who had repeatedly failed at this point to be elected president. He was still trying to become president of the United States, still leading the National Republican Party, and he still saw Andrew Jackson as his great nemesis. The question was, where could he get enough, get enough allies to defeat Jacksonian politics? One of the places he could turn for allies was the Anti-Masonic Party. The Anti-Masonic Party was a party founded specifically to challenge the influence of a group called the Freemasons. Throughout the United States early history, many prominent politicians, including George Washington himself, were members of the, of the Freemasons. The Freemasons were a fraternal order in other words, sort of a brotherly club with their beliefs founded in Christianity, but they did a lot of things in secret. They had secret meetings, secret signs that they used with each other, things like that, that made a lot of people suspicious of them. Some people looked at them as sort of an evil conspiracy. Well, a man named William Morgan decided to publish a book 
as it was said in the, in the um, subtitle of it, Revealing the Secrets of Freemasonry. Well, before this book could be published, William Morgan went missing and was found eventually dead. And many blame, the, blame this on the Freemasons trying to silence him. So we have this group out in society that people are already suspicious of, and then one of its critics is found dead. This led even more people to turn against the Freemasons. Those who were against them, who thought they had too much influence over society because too many politicians from Andrew Jackson, excuse me, from George Washington up to Andrew Jackson himself were members of it. Those people who saw that as too much power decided to form a political party to oppose it. What happened first was they got together and in 1828, they wrote an anti-Masonic Declaration of Independence. Basically a document declaring that the United States of America would no longer tolerate the influence of Masons in the country's government. Then in 1830, they held a national convention where they nominated candidates for various offices in the country. But when the election of 1832 came along, they were an electoral failure. With rare exceptions, none of their candidates won. This led them to realize their political weakness and the necessity of allying with others if they were going to accomplish their purpose of getting rid of Andrew Jackson and other Masons in government. With Henry Clay and the National Republican Party, the Freemasons then collectively formed a new political party called the Whigs. The Whigs, W-H-I-G, get their name from a political party that had existed in England one at one point who had opposed the power of the king there. The Whigs became the primary opposition party to the Republicans. During the next election in 1836, Andrew Jackson did not run for re-election. Instead, his vice president, Martin Van Buren, ran to continue the Andrew Jackson legacy. In that election, he won fairly easily, defeating several other candidates, including a Whig candidate. Actually, multiple Whig candidates. Well, by 1840, the Whig party finally had their act together and they were ready to char challenge, excuse me, challenge Martin Van Buren, who was not a particularly noteworthy president. The Whigs got clever and they had nominated a war hero, William Henry Harrison, the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, as their Whig candidate. They chose as a vice president a man named Tyler, who was a just recently former Democrat who had come over to the Whigs who still believed in many democratic ideals too, as a way to potentially appeal to otherwise democratic voters to come vote for the Whigs instead. So they chose this war hero candidate and then they emphasized his rough and tumble upbringing as a frontier child. That he was born in a log cabin and he was raised drinking hard cider. Cider is a beverage made from apples. Hard cider means that it has alcohol in it. So this is a very sort of common man, country sort of appeal. Remember, America is becoming more democratic all the time. You need to appeal more to the common man to win. The other slogan that was used to promote people to vote for William Henry Harrison was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. He had been given the nickname Tippecanoe because that's where he had had his great victory as a general of American troops against Native American tribes. So Tippecanoe and Tyler too, referring to the vice presidential candidate, became a big campaign slogan for those who wanted others to vote for William Henry Harrison. Well, he ended up being successful. The Whig candidate finally defeated a Democrat. Martin Van Buren, who only served one term after Andrew Jackson, lost to William Henry Harrison, and we had our first Whig president. But when Andrew, excuse me, when um, William Henry Harrison gave his inauguration speech, his speech to the country after being sworn in as president, he spoke for about an hour in extremely cold, wet weather, and he got sick. He never got better. And about a month later, he died without doing a single 
substantive thing of any importance as president. His vice president then, John Tyler, became president. But the irony of this is that John Tyler wasn't really much of a Whig. He was a recent convert to the Whigs from the Democratic Party, and he still hold, held most Democratic values in his heart. He had only switched over as a potential way to keep his career growing, and it did for a while. But nonetheless, when he became president, his own party ended up rejecting him. They called him his accidency, referring to the idea that he had accidentally become president of the United States, not that they ever really wanted him to be. Well, after he was elected, the next big event that came to the country was the Panic of 1837. Remember, these panics are economic downturns. In this case, part of the root of the problem was the integrated economy that we've already talked about as we discussed the tariff of abominations. Northern mills made finished products which could be sold, but they made them from Southern cotton harvested by African Americans in Southern fields. Now, why do I point this out? Because what this meant was that the economy was tied together throughout the country. A economic disruption one place will lead to an economic disruption everywhere. In this case, the economic disruption came because of the settlement of Western lands. I've mentioned before this idea of land speculation as we talked about the Panic of 1819. Well now, almost two decades later, even more Western lands have been opened up for settlement and even more people are speculating that those lands will be eventually worth more. And so what they do in the meantime is they buy up as much of those lands as they can. Well, that only works if the lands actually do go up in value. Well, in this case, they didn't. And there were several reasons why this happened. There were several things that contributed to the economy falling. One, which we'll, that we've already talked about, is land speculation. The other was bank-issued notes. In other words, paper money um, corresponding to the banks. Because people generally use that sort of money, access to gold and silver was actually very limited. But that made it hard for the United States of America to pay debts that they owed, particularly to the British who would only accept coins. So you had all these threads out there where something isn't going right. Multiple things aren't going right. And at any moment they could come tumbling down. Well, the thing that propped them to tumble down was the passage of a law called the Species Circular. I should say, shouldn't say the passage of a law. Instead, this was a requirement that was made as the federal government sold lands in the West that the land purchases be done in metal money, either gold or silver. Now, this had an effect of the people who wanted to buy in land in the West had to figure out some way to get gold and silver, which is not easy to do if you don't already have um, a bunch of money. Um, the other problem that was flowing out of this species circular being passed was that by requiring that the Western lands be bought with gold and silver and people not having it, it meant that the demand for these lands then crashed. Now remember, they were purchased because people thought that they'd be able to get more money for them later. Well, if their value drops, then those people are out a bunch of money. And that's what happened. The value of the land dropped because not as many people were trying to purchase them the plots of land, and as not many people were trying to purchase them because of species circular, which required that it be done in gold or silver. Well, this triggered a chain reaction. As Western, Western land values dropped, people lost money, they made a run on banks to get money, other people heard about the run on banks, they went to the banks too to get their money. Pretty soon the banks don't have enough money left to pay all the people that are coming asking for their money. And this led, leads to a general decline in um, uh, respect for and confidence in the economy. And once people think things are going to turn down, they do turn down. And we end up with an outright depression in the country from 1837 to 1843. A depression like that then puts pressure on uh, people as they are working the same jobs and not making as much money, or they lose their jobs. 
and they oftentimes look around for a scapegoat, someone to blame for the fact that they can't get the job that they want. Well, that feeling of blame then leads to the nativist movement. This was a movement in America where those who had been born in America, even though their ancestors had come as immigrants previously, then felt that this country belonged to them and they didn't want more foreigners coming in. So this nativist movement became focused particularly, became focused particularly on the immigrants coming from Ireland and from Germany. We've seen this cartoon before about the Know Nothing Party, one of the big um, party, excuse me, one of the big groups that was particularly opposed to immigration who actually formed their own political party to run candidates for office. I previously told you about them in the last chapter, but I did not tell you that their official name was the American Party, meaning the Native Party, the Party of the Americans. They were particularly concerned about immigrants coming from Ireland and coming from Germany and taking their jobs. And a lot of that um, distrust and, and um, negative attitude toward these immigrants from Ireland and Germany was because of religious prejudice. The United States of America was a predominantly Protestant country. But lots of these immigrants coming into the country from these other places were Catholics. Well, this led to a Catholic and excuse me, an anti-Catholic attitude among many Americans. They saw not just German citizens coming in, potentially taking their jobs, but Catholic citizens coming and possibly taking their jobs. Another thing that led to social tensions in this time period was the place of slavery and of free blacks in American society. We already talked about some of the conflicts around um, slavery, but free blacks were an issue too, although there weren't as many of them. These were people who had either been gifted their freedom or had earned their freedom, or were perhaps born into freedom if their parents had gotten away from slavery before them. There are about 400,000 in the United States of America at this time, which is a pretty significant group of the population. Well, this worried the white majority. And so they are starting to see things kind of come apart at the edges. You've got these immigrants coming from Ireland and Germany that are coming in and changing America. You've got free blacks asserting their freedoms and possibly inspiring slaves to rise up against the white masters. This increases tension among these groups. Well, this tension was felt not just in the South, but in the North. An example of this can be seen in the martyrdom of Elijah Lovejoy, who is someone who we have previously mentioned. What happened in this case was Elijah Lovejoy was a newspaper publisher in Missouri and things got too hot for him to stay there. He was afraid that if he continued to publish articles against slavery as Virginia, excuse me, as Missouri became a, a slave state, that he would get run out of business. So before that could happen, he moved his newspaper across the river to Illinois, where he continued to publish articles, commentary against the practice of slavery. Well, what happened was those northerners were no more interested in hearing that message than the southerners were. While northerners might not want to keep slaves, they also don't want to be lectured about what horrible people they are for allowing slavery to happen in their country. So Lovejoy moved to Illinois to try to get away from the persecution that he felt in Missouri. But when he got there, he ended up being persecuted by the people in Illinois also. They wanted to avoid this conflict over slavery. So they didn't want an anti-slavery writer with an anti-slavery newspaper like a love Elijah Lovejoy coming to their community. So they attacked his printing house to try to burn it down. He was there and he fought them off and got rid of the flames. Well, eventually he was unable to continue to fight back and the building was set fire and he was burned alive in it. And he became a martyr to the cause of ending slavery. Yet not every American was ready to try to bring blacks into a position of equality with Americans. For example, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, 
created a character based on actual black performers that he had seen in various shows, which he then used to mimic their behaviors. That character became known as Jim Crow. So Thomas Dartmouth Rice would play this character, Jim Crow, by putting black shoe polish on his face, and he would perform in a mocking way to fulfill white audiences' lowest expectations of how they thought slaves behaved. And he called this character Jim Crow. A reason to remember this is that that term Jim Crow continues to be used in the language, in the English language in the United States. But now it doesn't refer to these minstrels, it refers to the idea of segregating the races. But where it came from was these shows put on by these white performers like Thomas Dartmouth Smith, excuse me, Dar Thomas Dartmouth Rice, where they would dress up as blacks and perform in an exaggerated manner like them. Well, this does it for this uh, last slide in this chapter nine.